In 2021, renewables is a hot topic uh, in the investment arena at the moment. Add into that the potential for what is relatively secure income, and it makes for a really interesting story. Uh, we're now joined by James Armstrong. He is managing partner at Bluefield Partners, investment advisor at the Bluefield Solar Income Fund. James, it's good to talk to you. We've spoken to you before about this. It's an interesting story. I have to say, first of all, before we begin the interview, that I am an interested party in this as an investor in the fund. But I want to begin, first of all, if I can, by taking uh, another look at just what it is you're seeking to achieve here at Bluefield Partners uh, as the investment advisor to the fund. Sure. Great, great to see you again, Jeremy. Um, so the fund, Bluefield uh, Soda Income Fund, is focused on, on giving yield to investors. So it's a UK-focused sterling income fund focused on renewables, but primarily solar investments. And We've built one of the, the highest performing funds of its kind, which is listed on the on the London Stock Exchange and have delivered so far since our IPO in, in 2013, Jeremy, we've delivered annualized returns of just in excess of 10 percent a year. So it's been a really good performing fund. And I said at the top, of course, it's an interesting time because renewables very much a hot topic, as I said. Uh, just um, illustrate why and um, what this is playing into in terms of the cycle we're in. Yeah, it's a really good question. It, it's an incredibly exciting and important time for renewables globally, but also in the in the UK. And it, it comes down to the intersection of three very powerful forces. One is public policy. So people who have seen before Christmas Boris's 10-point plan. So we have obviously the, the three-word slogan there, Jeremy, which is build back better. And one of the consequences of the pandemic is obviously there needs to be very significant infrastructure investment. And one of the big areas of focus is the green economy. So what you're seeing is the expectation over the coming decade of very supportive policies, public policies, and very significant growth in renewable and storage infrastructure. The second component of this is economics. Probably the most powerful chart you can see in the energy markets today is the cost reduction of wind, solar, and battery storage. You look at that, and it means that um, today, in most places in the world, and indeed in the UK, you can um, have renewables without subsidy. So whilst you, it's very important to have good, supportive public policy, the economics of renewables now means it's competitive with fossil fuels. And then the third element, which is not to be underestimated, is just stakeholder pressure. It's about um, individuals putting pressure on governments, on their pension funds, on their companies to be more green. And so you're seeing this really in the explosion of ESG funds, which is where if you look at where a lot of the money is going, and, and the, in the UK has been a, an absolute leader here, global leader in terms of the investment companies world that I'm involved with, um, where you've got nine billion has been invested into uh, renewable investment companies in the last seven or eight years. And that's because there is uh, significant amounts of capital being allocated into ESG and renewable uh, funds, which in turn are making their way to companies like Bluefield. So you put those three elements together, Jeremy, it's an incredibly powerful uh, conditions for growth. Let's pick up on this bit about uh, subsidies, if we can. I know, again, we've spoken about this before, but I'm interested in seeing how this is developing, because I know that the government uh, gave subsidies very early on. And indeed, that happened for a while. But my understanding is now that if I was to build a new solar farm now, I wouldn't get the same sort of level of subsidy uh, that we used to be seeing. Um, my understanding is that is the case. Is that right? And how much of what Bluefield has does benefit from these subsidies? Well, I think with you, when you're talking to, about a, a fund like the Bluefield Solar Income Fund, you get, you're get you going to get the, the best of both worlds. So because we were an early mover, you have today um, about 60, 60% of our revenues are regulated uh, and they're long-term regulated. And so that means they're not um, correlated to market conditions um, and they are RPI licks. They're very, very attractive. And it's one of the reasons the sector has been so robust in the past 12 months in terms of dividend payouts, because you've got this base of very, very strong revenues. Um, the balance is uh, for our business is selling the power uh, through short-term uh, power price contracts. Now, going forward, in fact, the, the answer to your question is actually a mixture of both. So there will be government support for 
Um, offshore wind is a big area, onshore wind and solar through contracts are different. So you will have, um, going into very competitive auctions, you will have uh, up to 20 year support mechanisms, which will be very, very closely priced to the prevailing market price. So it's very, very good for the consumer, but you still as an investor have long-term certainty over the revenues. Um, alongside subsidy free, which is where there are some attract, you know, because of the this cost reduction I've mentioned, that you also have the ability to be able to invest into non-subsidized assets. So it's a combination of the two. But overall, when you're talking about Bluefield or some of the other uh, early mover funds, there's some very, you know, very attractive revenue profile. Do you think, as as we see the subsidies uh, come out of the system or taper down? Do you think it's less and less likely we're going to get uh, a, the same sort of level of interest from investors because the returns presumably won't be the same or as robust as they have been during the subsidy period? I think all the indications, Jeremy, are the opposite. Um, it, it is a sector which is seeing unbelievable amounts of capital going in. There's, a, there's an extraordinary statistic uh, that I was just reading recently about just in the US market, which is it's actually seen to be behind Europe, and behind the UK into renewables. And um, a report came out from the Sustainable Finance um, uh, Association, which was talking about one in three, and they're talking about about $17 trillion, one in three dollars uh, is now being allocated into ESG and sustainable strategies. Now, there might be a little bit of greenwashing there in terms of exactly where that money is going, but this gives you an indication of the amount of capital that's going in. So I think the answer at the moment is um, you're going to have a lot of capital going into the sector plus increased support from policymakers. And I think that those two things give very strong conditions for um, you know, supportive growth and supportive returns. Let's uh, focus in on what uh, the Bluefield Solar Income Fund is doing at the moment. And uh, we've seen this recent acquisition in Wiltshire. Uh, interesting in as much as that I believe is one of the largest of its type in the UK. Is that right? Yep, the, the largest solar farm, uh, uh, 70 megawatts. So it's a very, very large solar farm, uh, which is on uh, RF Lynham in Wiltshire. So it's a, it's a great example of taking land that wasn't being used productively by the, um, by the MOD um, and uh, creating a, a, a very, very standout solar farm. So we were delighted with that ac acquisition. What's the, what's, what's the payback like? What sort of uh, dynamics we're looking at financially for this and, and how it uh, works with the fund? Sure. I mean, for us, it's a great addition to the fund. So it, it's about, we, we now have over 600 megawatts of solar farms. So to give you an idea, I mean, that's sort of, we're talking about about 3,000 acres worth of solar farms uh, spread about of, of about 60 or so uh, very large solar farms, typically in the south of England and Wales. Um, the, this is a really just good addition because, again, it goes back to this, um, uh, this sort of the revenue characteristics, which we find so attractive, Jeremy, which are you've got around about 60 percent of the revenues are regulated and then about 40 percent are you're just selling the power into the grid. So it's a really, it's a fantastic example of a very defensive uh, income asset and, and it's a great addition to the portfolio. Yeah. What about um, where, where we go in 2021 in terms of the pipeline for acquisitions? Do you have your eyes on anything else? You, you seem to have set upon this rather uh, unique way of trying to uh, make the most of land that might otherwise not be available, as in this case at RAF Lynham. Are there any other sort of similar sort of moves you're planning this year? Yeah, I mean, we are, we're very much in acquisition mode and we uh, the big news for us last year was that we got very strong support from our shareholder base to broaden the mandate so we're still UK focused but we broadened the mandate um, because we originally we were just solar and we've got now uh, the ability to do onshore wind and storage and storage is an important part of this story Jeremy um, that as you get as you get more renewables onto the grid, then it will increase the uh, intermittent generation, obviously, because base load is coming off and you're getting more intermittent generators, so solar and wind coming onto the system. And that's going to cause, um, that creates more volatility in the short term. It's a natural consequence of, of obviously, decarbonisation, um, more volatility on the grid. And so one of the ways to address that, it's very important for renewables generally, is obviously this, the storage story, which is 
Um, I mentioned about the cost of you know, storage coming down, and that's something that we're looking at alongside uh, wind and solar acquisition. So that's what you should be looking for over the next sort of couple of years is that a broadening of the base of assets um, for, for Bluefield, but very much sticking to our principles of looking at it as a, as a very defensive yield play. You talk about the support from investors last year. I think you raised 45 million last year. Is that right? In an oversubscribed um, raising. What are you going to yeah. use that for? Or has that now all been used? Um, no, all been, all been allocated. Well, yeah, it was it was used um, actually just to pay down part of a, a credit facility that we had, a short term financing facility, um, uh, which has then been reused actually for the, the recent acquisition on for Britain State, which is the, the RF Linum acquisition. Um, so yes, it was a very it was a very well supported fundraise. I think you're seeing that generally. Um, Bluefield has very strong support from the shareholder base, but you're seeing that generally as part of the sort of thematic um, sort of move which you're seeing with investors for ESG and renewables. Um, and it's great to see. And and I have to say, I'd say the the, the London market has been standout uh, in its uh, in its sort of development of uh, the green economy. Yeah, let me just bring up a share price chart, going back to the beginning of 2017. In fact, you can see the spike that we had, the the, the deep COVID spike that we had last year that everybody seemed to um, suffer from. And of course, I mean, this was, I guess, perhaps possibly maybe deeper than some of the spikes lower that we've seen. Uh, as I say, taking us back to levels not seen since the beginning of uh, 2017, late 2016. But then this big snapback, uh, currently trading at 134 and a half. What's your message to shareholders as uh, you, you see this burgeoning area of, um, of, of renewables? 2020 was a really interesting story for renewables and also, you know, kind of the dividend story, which, which you've, uh, you mentioned in your sort of early questions about it being a really you know, good yield play. Um, if you look at, say, just a comparator, say, to the FTSE 100, the, you saw the sort of decimation of, of dividends in in you know, post-COVID, the pandemic started, and I think something like 20 billion was either with dividend withdrawn or, or withheld. Um, what you saw with the renewables market was that we obviously had this, you know, dip in share price, and then they came back up, and it's because it's people realised the fundamentals were there, and so the renewable sector, you know, the leading funds, um, there wasn't a single fund in the renewable sector that um, changed their dividend or, or dropped their dividend. Um, uh, and so you, you end the year in 2020 where the FTSE is averaging something like three and a half percent dividend and the renewable sector is six. And when you consider that the majority of those revenues are regulated and non-correlated, it's a really good trade-off for investors. And I think what it's proven is the robustness of the, the sector's business uh, strategy uh, and also the robustness of the revenues. And so it's been a, it's been a very, very uh, strong story to tell throughout this pandemic. Uh, just, just one final question, actually, from someone that is steeped in this area, as indeed you are. Just like your view, if I possibly can, uh, to get from some commentary that's been levelled at the Bank of England uh, for failing to bend quantitative easing towards uh, environmental benefits. I think um, there's been a lot of um, uh, criticism about the way the Bank of England has performed. Do you have any thoughts on this particularly? Would you like to see more money uh, provided into um, ESG and renewables from such as QE, or, or do you think the Bank of England is doing the right thing as it is? Yeah, I don't really sort of comment on Bank of England policy. I mean, certainly politically, it's a big thing in the EU, as you'll be aware, as in fact, uh, Christine Lagarde is is using the central bank as a, as a vehicle for uh, sort of green uh, initiatives. So they've taken that decision. I, I think um, to be <clears throat> my position at the moment is I think that um, the renewable sector is uh, is strong enough to stand up on its own. Um, I don't think you know it's a it's a political decision, um, but one where I think where we today, if we if we have the right policy measures um, in place from the government and consistent policy measures, plus obviously the the aforementioned obviously economics which are driving this growth, which is you know which the industry has created, then um, you know I think we're in a in a very strong position to continue our growth. I'd like to catch up with you again, if I can, at the back end of the year. What are we going to be talking about at the back end of 2021 when, when we do speak? Well, I've, obviously, the, the end of the pandemic uh, would be great if we actually get on that. <laughs> we uh, or we, don't, we yeah. don't have to mention it at all. Um, 
Uh, and I, I, I think the, I think all the indications are at the moment that we will continue to see very strong capital flows into the sector, and I would hope to see very strong support um, for the sector continued. Um, and what we, what we certainly expect to see is another very strong uh, yield performance from companies like Bluefield, where we have delivered what we expected to for our shareholders. Okay, we'll catch you up on that a uh, little bit later on. Yeah, James, thanks indeed for joining us uh, and, and stay safe. And indeed, we hope we'll get back together again in the studio later on in the year when uh, post-COVID, Absolutely, yeah. if we can. It'll, it'll be my pleasure. James, thanks indeed for joining us. That's James Armstrong. He's managing partner at Bluefield Partners, the investment advisor to the Bluefield Solar Income Fund. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGTV and subscribe to our YouTube channel.